we are starting a monthly series here called TFIR Topic of the Month or T3M. The idea of the series is to take a pulse of the ecosystem of the industry and then bring together experts to deep dive into these topics. And today we have with us once again, Catherine Magave, Chair of Cloud Foundry Foundation and Vice President of Software Engineering at VMware. Catherine, it's great to have you back on the show. Thank you, Swapnil. Great to be here. Yeah, and today the discussion is going to be around cost cutting or to be uh, more precise, being more cost efficient in this economy. Uh, we are seeing a lot of movement within the industry. What are you seeing? What kind of trends you are seeing, which we can look at it where companies are trying to become more cost efficient? Yeah, I think one of the um, most interesting trends is just really the, one of the easiest costs to sort of um, clamp down a little bit on is cloud spend. You know, are you really utilizing the environments you're spinning up? Are you taking good diligence in spinning them down? What's that cost spend across your organization? Um, when you think of travel t &E and cost uh, cloud spend seem to be the, the two big ones that companies are looking at how to put more controls on because they're easy ones to adjust and turn off and on as, as a company's sort of financial status changes. What role can Cloud Foundry play to actually help companies become more uh, cost efficient? As you know, I'm a big fan of open source and open source, even um, outside of my role in Cloud Foundry, we do a lot of investment in. What Cloud Foundry provides is if if another um, product or capability is provided through the software and you don't have to develop it yourself, that's always a win. You can get lift from that. Now you still have to patch and maintain whatever comes out of the open source. And so I, I think one of the best ways companies can gain efficiency is really look for what uh, commonality exists versus what they're building and how do they get lift out of the open source so they have to do less development. Um, that me means sort of smaller, more focused teams as a result, which can be really effective with getting more reach in the market. Um, so that open source work. Now, where Cloud Foundry really shines on this is it's tailored its open source and the platform as a whole, uh, really shining on developer needs. So instead of a developer saying, hey, I want a space or I want an environment and it needs to have this type of HA and this type of environment, it really levels up the conversation. So developers are saying, hey, I have an app. And I have an app I want to deploy. So it changes the context of where they're focusing. And that creates a lot of lift even in their day-to-day -day of how much work they have to do to get spun up or get a new environment up and running. As teams are getting smaller, uh, we are, I mean, I've been running a show and what we hear is that companies will also cut down on uh, do-it-yourself or, you know, that so-called not invented hair syndrome. They will rely more on open source technology because the, the technology is already there. And of course, I remember somebody said that, you know, uh, the proprietary code should be more like Tabasco sauce in your food, not the whole food. So you should use a lot of open source. So do you think that we will also see uh, more adoption of open source where companies will utilize that, you know, because it does make them. Uh, and also, there's a whether we look at Cloud Foundry or Kubernetes, there's a massive ecosystem of vendors who can come in, help you once you uh, move to day. It's, it's smart of companies to go down that path. The challenge, I think, is there's, there's actually a cost to that investment. Anytime you're introducing a new tool into your tool chain, there's the integration cost of that, and there's the maintenance cost of that. And I think if you go in understanding those costs and understanding the trade-offs, um, you can get a lot of, want, lot of win out of it. Now, um, often as a company, if you're getting open source work, you want to make sure it stays aligned. And this is where it motivates companies to get invested in that community and to ensure it's aligned to their longer term interests associated with it as well. Um, the biggest challenge, I think, with open source work and getting that lift is the CV management and the patching. And that's where I'm seeing a lot more internal investment happen, um, both from the community side, but also from a lot of the, the companies we work really closely with, that investment in how do we maintain and patch and keep up to date all of the, te all of the software we're using. Um, and there's a bit more control when you're doing it yourself and you rely a bit on others in the open source community as it comes in. Talk a bit about, once again, the role Cloud Foundry plays, because we had the discussion earlier that Cloud Foundry kind of brings the developer experience to the Kubernetes ecosystem uh, in this you know Kubernetes-centric or cloud-centric world. With Kubernetes, Kubernetes really changed the game on what is the new ecosystem where you can run any workload, whether it's a data service or an app or a function. It kind of set the level playing field for here's one inter interface you can use to run all of that. What Kubernetes uh, enabled is fantastic, but the actual outcome that users care about is I want an app, I want it running, and I want it stable. 
and I want to know the status of it and I want to do as little as possible work on that environment to make that happen. And so from a cost cutting measure, um, we talk about controls. If you can put controls or guardrails in place to make it simple for a developer to have what they need and to have it in a controlled way so you know what you're providing to the developers, then you can be really cost efficient with that. The more choice you provide, the longer it takes a person to make a decision and the more complex that cost cutting structure needs to be. And so I, I think about this from really simple use case perspective. If I'm an application developer and I wanna run my app and it's my team environment, it's my dev environment where it's the first time we all integrate together, um, I might only have one choice of my SQL database to connect to. It won't be HA, it'll be simple, there won't be um, backup or restore available with it. Now, if I'm going to a, a staging or a larger environment, that'll shift. And so when I think about the cost cutting measures that are there, it's also limiting choice to environments where that choice isn't needed. And there can be feedback cycles and that can change and giving choice where it is needed, where the costs also increase as associated to that choice. And if you can level up the conversation to, it doesn't actually matter where it's running and focus it to what is the outcome that matters, you actually get the win there, both on cost and efficiency of getting uh, that app closer to production. As it relates to, to Kubernetes, you've also got the challenge of deployment or upgrade. Um, so thinking of costs and thinking of how much you have up and running, can you do a rolling upgrade experience or rolling deployment of your app? Can you reroute traffic and drain well? You know, Terraform and others are doing a great job of paving the ecosystem and the environment, but that day two story of if it's up and running, how do I control that or how is that done in an effective and cost manner is still something that's evolving in the community and is a problem yet to be solved. And those are kind of the higher level concerns that an app developer or a platform engineer really cares about doing well, because that's a huge cost impact if that's not managed. Uh, and uh, as you already talked about uh, developer experience, and I, and I wanted to go there, uh, so I would appreciate if you can talk about that. What exactly do you mean by developer, ex ex developer experience? And also, once again, in today's world, how, I mean, once again, developer, uh, developer experience is not just about, you know, getting the right muffin that developers write. It's about a lot of other things as well. So talk about what does it mean? And once again, how does it play in making companies more cost efficient? Yeah, so I think we think about a developer experience there. Developers are really looking for how do I leverage what exists? So there's a discovery element of what applications exist already, what APIs, what libraries? How do I get lift from the company I work within? And then there's also the um, how do I know what choices are sanctioned or approved? So there's an element of discovery, discovery of what exists and discovery of common practices and concerns. And that's a really important part of the developer experience. That can cut down um, speed, uh, it can improve developer efficiency because if that's really clear and I have one place to discover that, I'm able to make those decisions and move on. If I'm not, I can spend a lot of time in that discovery. So that, that discovery piece of making developers uh, effective is really important. The next step is, as I need something, how do I get that in a self-service way? If I have to create a ticket and wait for someone to provision and respond to that ticket, that's going to that's gonna eat up on my time. And that's not efficient for either party, uh, those, those receiving the ticket or the person creating it. So we talk about the developer experience. What we're really talking about is, is the discovery of what exists and the self-service capability and the uh, definition of what's approved and not approved associated with that. Catherine, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about this topic. And as usual, I would love to have you back on the show. Thank you. Always a pleasure as well. Now, thank you.